Hey everybody, thanks for watching a very special edition of Be Better Golf Live. Today I am here with Hugh Marr. Hugh is joining us from England, right, Hugh? Yeah, from uh, cold, wet, miserable England. But yeah, that's where I am. Right. And also we're joined by Justin Tang in Singapore, who is a PGA Tour coach, who is the producer of Be Better Golf Live. Thanks for joining me, everybody. I wanted to talk to you, Hugh. Hugh is a coach and a track band expert. He's one of the foremost track band experts in the world. And he's also teaches uh, European tour players, PGA tour players, and regular golfers as well. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk to him a, a bunch about different things that can help people be better at golf. The first thing I wanted to ask you, Hugh, to break it down, because this is knowledge that I wish all golfers had when it comes to the things that like a real track man expert knows, I wish that regular golfers knew as far as like, you see your ball get hit. You know, it, when you see a regular golfer make a mistake, you know, they, they, and then you say, well, why did that happen? And they tell you about their elbow and their knee and their hip. And then they're you know, like a lesson they had two years ago. But like, you'd like to know, like, no, like, like from the standpoint of a collision, why did that happen? So talk to us a little bit about what you've learned in track man especially when it comes to like ball flight laws and what's happening at impact that makes the ball do different things. Okay. So, I mean, to give you a little bit of a background here about how I've ended up with becoming this track man dude, I guess that I, I was always extremely frustrated by the lack of objectivity in golf instruction and everything seemed to be kind of sort of story or what a player felt um, or what mm. they thought they saw on video. And if you look through the sort of history of, of golf coaching or golf teaching, uh, that's basically where it's, it's, all, it's always been subjective stuff. And I quite like, I'm a fairly binary guy. I, I like the black and white element of it. There's certain things that we know to be true. And then there's certain things that we believe to be true and certain things that just aren't true. And tra <clears throat> what Trapman's done for me is it's allowed me to identify exactly how the club is interacting with the ball on the ground through the impact area, which has then led me to be able to make more educated judgment calls on why that's happening. Is this a start position issue? Is it a movement issue? Is it a concept issue? When it comes to actually understanding the, I guess, the, the, the mechanical equation of impact, which is a combination of geometry and force. That's all it is. We can measure both. And there's certain impact parameters that I like to see for certain shots. But the beauty of this, of, of this piece of equipment is that it tells you whether that person's golf swing is able to produce the ball flight that they want. With a sport that's just, it's so surrounded by this subjective kind of storytelling, it's nice to be able to pin it in something a little bit more meaningful, a little bit more binary. Every golf lesson I give, the first thing I'm looking at is how's the ball flying? Hopefully the ball is flying, in which case it's a different golf lesson, but how's the ball flying, number one? Number two, what is it about that club's behavior that is resulting in that ball flight? And then from there, I start to dig a little bit deeper and say, well, okay, well, what is it about this player's start position and or movement that's resulting in that club behavior, which is resulting in that ball flight? So that's basically the, if, if you like, the, co the coaching cycle that I'll work around. And do you use, like, um, to explain the ball flight laws to somebody, do you use, like, the face sends it and the path bends it or like what's a real simple version of how we can understand what's happening with the face and well, I the, the path to influence the ball i think the if you like the poor man's track man is is your eye right okay. so assuming middle contact when a player strikes it out the middle where does it start and where does it curve so that will tell you, yeah. number one, where the face is aligned at impact. And number two, where the face is aligned relative to the path of the club. And that is that objective feedback, because we know that the ball is on a center strike. The ball's going to start where the face was aligned. We know it's going to curve dependent on that face relationship with path. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And every golfer has got that tool available to them. They don't need this $25,000 orange box, that piece of information, that analysis tool is available to everyone. What's something that you wish that every golfer, like, you know, that's trying to get better that like, a, uh, what do you think is the, the 
most important tool in their toolbox to have? Would it be like to analyze their own swing, to be able to tell what the ball's doing? What do you think? <clears throat> to have access to a coach that understands impact appropriately mm -hmm. and builds their coaching around the desired impact for that player. That's where golf coaches can have an impact. Hugh, I know you don't like training aids that can't fit into your bag. So with that in mind, how can a golfer say work to fix his hook or his slice using the information that you've just explained to us? So, okay, so we know that we know enough about impact. I don't think we know everything about impact, but we know enough about impact to know that if the ball starts right and curves right, the face is open and vice versa. So what's the first thing I'm going to do, if you like, in my coaching hierarchy? What's the first thing I'm going to do? Well, if I'm seeing that ball curve excessively, I'm going to fix the face to pass relationship. What components will I look at first? Is the start position resulting in that curvature? So is the face misaligned at address? Is the face misaligned to the grip at address or the hands at address? That's where I'll start. Is the shaft in the appropriate position? Is he, is, is he or she able to, to send the path appropriate to that face? So I'll always start with what I call static principles. Does the start position correspond with the shot they want to hit? Is it contributing to the shot they are hitting? So I'll always start there. Face is open, generally I'm going to lean the, sh the handle more at address and give them a stronger grip and probably move the ball back. If it's hooking, I'm going to do the opposite. That's a very crude example, but that's always where I'm going to start. Can you talk a little bit about what you like and perhaps dislike about modern coaching? Uh, too form-driven, too trend-driven. So obviously a flexed or bowed lead wrist is quite trendy just now, just because the best players in, or the majority of the best players in the world seem to be employing that. The truth is I don't think any of them were ever coached to do that. They just found that as their best way to put club on ball appropriately. So a sort of cookie cutter, one size fits all approach for me is, I'm nervous of that, number one. Number two, I hate, particularly now, given we've got technology to measure it, I hate coaching that's not directly attached to the player hitting better shots. I, I dislike players being told that they just need to have hundreds of reps to get it right. Personally, if I cannot change that interaction between club ball and ground in three shots, I shouldn't be doing this for a living. So hang on, you're, you're saying that you do not have to get worse to get better. 100%. Now, making a change is relatively simple. The player owning that change is what takes time. So I know that if I do X, Y, and Z to this player in front of me, it's going to give me the player the opportunity to produce appropriate impact. Now, they may not choose to use that every time, but at least I've got them started. The process of owning any change is what takes the time. But if, as I said, if I can't shift impact in three balls, I've flat out failed. For some reason, we're, I've, I've had a conversation with a bunch of coaches this morning about it, that for some reason, quick tip coaching is seen as being a, a bad thing. And I, I don't even refer to it as quick tip. It's like, is this an appropriate piece of advice? So coaching on tour is the ultimate in quick tip coaching. Because you've got to get this player hitting better shots now. Now, great coaching for me is quick tips built around a plan. But this, I, I think so much of this is driven by coaches looking for a reason not to accept responsibility that well, you just need to get used to it. It needs, it needs reps, it needs reps. Yeah, coaches will say, like, I don't do Band-Aids, you know. We, we have, this is real surgery we have to do here. Yep. It, I, I don't know. I think there's a, there's a lot of ego in that. It's a sexy okay. product. Um, but ultimately, our job is really simple as golf coaches. We need to, number one, make sure every single golfer that comes to us gets better. Not, and not gets better in a year's time. I can promise you improvement in a year's time because guess what? That year never comes. Mm -hmm. They need to get better now. Our job is to grow and better the game. Making it harder is not growing and bettering the game. Because if we're, if we're making golfers worse, it's not a great advert for what we do, right? <laughs> the, 
mm-hmm. at number one. Number two, is that really going to retain people in the game? Let's face it, it's a pretty freaking difficult game to love. It's hard, it takes time, it costs money, it's not particularly inclusive. It's it's a difficult game to love, and we're making it harder. I think when, when you look at the data behind people who've taken lessons, worldwide people who've touched a golf club, 3% of them have taken lessons or take regular lessons. That blows my mind. Number two, of the people, only 20% of people who take lessons come back. That blows my mind. That it's not actually that much, it's not difficult to make golfers better quickly. But for some reason, that's not what we're supposed to do. And then when they do hit good shots, it's our job to tell them that they've hit good shots, but they're not doing it right. That doesn't make any sense to me either. <laughs> See, that was great. You've just hit right. it 270 down the middle with a little draw, but we can, that's, it's just not right. That's going to break down under pressure. As far as like the problem that is impact, it's something that's been really uh, popular on Be Better Golf. Mm-hmm. And we talk about, you know, obviously like it depends is an answer that can um, be used for any golf question. <laughs> but uh, the w- as far as w- the way you like it, it seems like one of the fundamental problems of golf that I haven't heard a lot of golf coaches have a good solution to is that people get the hands to the golf ball, like say level with the golf ball, um, after they get the club head yep. there. So they get the club head there first, and then the hands come yep. through. Whereas like some of the tour players, I think all of the tour players that, that you coach, they're getting the hands to level with the golf ball first, for, and then they're past the golf ball, and it's through. Why is that such a mentally a, such a problem to be able to be leading the golf club through impact? Why does almost everybody want to get the club head out? And then what are some of your favorite or for like the first go-to solutions that you use to start getting a flipper into somebody that actually compresses it? And I'm not allowed to answer this by saying it depends, right? Well, it, well that's a given. <laughs> it's, it obviously depends. So, so you can say it depends. Just tell us what it depends. Okay, so we're, yeah. by and large, we're going to be dealing with club players or relatively novice players, right? But, but yeah. trust me, it, it exists at the very top of the game as well. Now, the place I will always start, if I'm coaching a beginner, I'll always start by introducing to them, them to the concept of correct impact. So if the player hits the club, hits the ground after the golf ball, then when the club is hitting the ball, the hands will be in front of it. So the concept element of it, I think, is particularly key, particularly with beginners. So... It's very easy, I think, for a non-golfer to assume that their role is to get the ball airborne. And then that the way that they choose to do that is to is to work the shaft back the way through impact. Um, okay. Our job is, is, first of all, to explain that the club has to hit the ground. It's going to hit the ground after impact. This is, of course, assuming the ball is sat on the ground. Um, so that they at least understand what correct club-ball-ground interaction should be. Then I think mm-hmm. your job as a coach is to ensure that Beginner golfers have got a toolbox that they can use, drills-wise, to build that feel. Now, when it comes to a more established golfer displaying the same traits, there's still a decent chance that their concepts are wrong. I had a kid here yesterday, really nice player. First question I asked him, again, I'm seeing the shaft two vertical from front on. First, uh, first thing I ask him is, well, so how does the club want to, how do you need the club to talk to ball and ground? Do you need it to hit the ground? Yeah, yeah, it needs to hit the ground. So where's it going to hit the ground? Uh, just about the same time as the ball. So his concept, mm-hmm. when he achieves his concept, he's still, he's still going to produce that, that kind of funky shape, right? So yeah. I explained to him, I want it here. I drew a line on the ground where the club needs to hit the ground and I put the ball behind that. So I've shifted his concept. Now, within, funnily enough, I was showing this to someone earlier, First shot, he's now got the shaft leaning forwards because I've given him a different task. All I've done is explain, well, your concept, not quite right. Correct concept, this. I drew a line three inches in front of the golf ball. I said, right, next swing, I want you to hit that line. Don't worry about the golf ball, hit that line. And first, first swing, he presents shaft lean. In terms of tools, that's one I'll use. I'll also get players to hit off a tee, get them to break the tee. Because obviously that's very difficult to do if the shaft's tilting back. Uh, the opposite of the line drill is to stick a towel behind the ball and ask them to hit the golf ball without hitting the towel. But mm-hmm. I won't employ any of these mechanisms 
until I know that their concept is sound. So always starting with concept and intent, then give them tools to help develop whatever. I mean, this applies to any part of the game, right? Hugh, why do you think that, because I've seen this a, a lot at the Be Better Golf Schools and, and, and myself too, um, sometimes people understand the concept and even when there's no golf ball there and they, you just ask them to take a divot, you know, uh, air swing that they actually take a divot, you'll see a lot of good things, especially through where, what would have been impact area. You know, the shaft is leaning forward. You're getting this bacon strip style divot. The face looks pretty darn square, you know, from what you can see. But when you put the ball there, they fall backwards. They they toss the head out at at it, and it, it's like it. There's like an interruption on the way down where the hands stop, and then the club head overtakes it. What do you think is the problem of the golf ball being there um, that makes it so 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 difficult for this kind of uh, reaction to flip at it? I think it's it's more a sort of psychological element or certainly a psychological element to it in that human beings are very risk averse because right. taking risks when we were in our formative stages of evolution meant that we ended up getting eaten by the tiger right so we've become we're, we're generally fairly risk averse and that means that as soon as you actually have to produce a task that results in an outcome that you might be measured by you're probably going to bias towards your old movement pattern and that's why what I call constraint-led coaching, where I actually put them in a position with various drills or games where they can only move well if they're going to execute it correctly, will help them build in the correct movement pattern over time. Okay. So that's the, pro the process of them owning that is what takes time. Can you get a player hitting down on the ball and hitting it in front of the ball? Yeah, I can, I'd be disappointed if you couldn't do that pretty quickly. So where they're, they're judged not so much by like, oh, you hit a, you hit a solid shot that drew, but they're more judged by like, hey, did you hit this line yeah. or did you whack the towel yeah. or did you hit the pool noodle, yeah. whatever it is. Okay. Let me ask you in a, in a similar vein, you know, so, so some of these problems are just like, I'm sure like as coaches, like you guys see all the time, it's like you're, you're dealing with a lot of the same problems again and again. So I think these are really interesting to hear. So if, if a, a player has the hands here and they're just always coming out before they go mm -hmm. down, you know? Even like, you know, you see this with uh, some like, some of the best players in the world have done, had a little loop that goes that way. And almost everybody is trying, every coach is trying to get the loop more like this, you know, that, that's from uh, steep to shallow rather than out and over. Is that a bad thing to ha have the, 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 the come out? And uh, t then how do you start building somebody where the, the plane that they're using is more contained and it doesn't get out over the line. What's the outcome you're looking for? Straight, solid shots, right? Yes. So yes. in my mind, I measure the quality of the technique by the quality of the outcome. Okay. So mm -hmm. I define good by tech, but technique by consistent, appropriate ball flight with a predictable miss. That's how I define functional technique. So Jim Furyk, very functional technique. Matt Kutcher, very functional technique. Two fundamentally different ways of yeah. doing it. And if you asked Furyk to employ some Kutcher and vice versa, both would get way worse. <laughs> so measuring the quality of a technique on what you see, for me, is already a dangerous path to take. Because we know there's guys that have thrown the hands out, steepened it, who've played at a very, very high level. And I'm pretty sure you look at the top 100 players in history, there'll be a fair few of them in there. Then you'll have the guys that shallow it and produce what's, I guess you could call it the modern golf swing. And you'll have probably yeah. the same amount of guys in that top 100 who do that. The consistent element here is that both produce consistent, appropriate impact with a predictable miss. Of course, there are certain characteristics that are mechanically advantageous. So relatively centered pivot, you'd say that was mechanically advantageous. But the, the challenge with the human race is that we're very good at working our, our way around problems. So if you have one characteristic in there, certainly good players will tend to counteract that with another one. And then that becomes, well, that's unorthodox because not, that looks a little bit too extreme or that's not what every good player does. The reality is 
I've never really cared about form. If I know that the player is producing the impact data I want on a consistent basis and they know how far it's going, how much shape it's going and how high it's going. That to me is great technique. Jim Furyk is one of the great golf swings in history. Yeah. Well, let me ask you, like, if I go to Florida and I go to the World Golf Hall of Fame mm-hmm. and I start, like, you know, bring a uh, clipboard with mm-hmm. me, I'm going to see strong, neutral, weak grips. I'm going to see um, closed, open, and, and square setups. I'm going to see all these different things. So this gets into a scary area for somebody trying to get better at golf because there's like, oh, well, here's all these guys that do all these different things. I'm still bad. You know, I do what he does and I do what he does and I do what he does. I don't do what he does. So you're like, okay, well, what's the point of even like trying to do anything other than shutting the world out and beating balls forever? So let me ask you, what even is fundamental to golf? Like they talk about the golf fundamentals. Well, there's guys that do almost everything differently. So what do you think is is like fundamental to not only to golf, but like to getting better at golf? consistent appropriate impact conditions that's fundamental you could say that okay. having the lead hand above the trail hand is fundamental but at some point we're going to have a top 10 player in the world that, that grips it left hand low at some point yeah uh, we just now we think that lead hand at the top is mechanically advantageous but we only think that yeah. because no one's come ar- come along like this let me pose a question to you on that front. If Harry Varden had gripped it baseball style or left hand low, do you think we'd be coaching the Varden grip? No. Nope. I don't think we would. Because he is an authority figure and we derive some kind of uh, acceptance from that. 100% agree. That's what an authority figure says. Okay. So what these guys do, your World Golf of Famers here, Brendan, what these guys do incredibly well is that they ensure that all of the components of their swing correspond. So Gankis, George will refer to these as matchups, and I think that's one of the reasons where George has become such an exceptional coach is he understands being able to basically go into this almost pick and mix and go, right, we're going to have a bit of that and a bit of that. What you have is effective matchups and that's basically the way i view golf swings so i I, i'll I'll analyze a golf swing and i'm looking at number one i need to know what ball flight they're hitting and what ball flight they want to hit because that's how i'm going to be measured number two i'm like well okay so does the start position allow the player a to create the impact geometry number one and number two does it allow the player to move appropriately so those two are Absolutely crucial. Now, that doesn't mean that they're instantly going to access good geometry or good movement, but at least you've given them the chance. And then I'm looking through all of that player's movement characteristics to see how many of their components are draw bias, fade bias, or straight bias. And my job is to ensure that all of the important components correspond to one another to produce the shot the player wants to hit. So I've been working with one of the coaches I mentor this morning. He's We've been doing a little case study of one of the youngsters he coaches who's trying to fade it. And basically 90, 90% of his key components are draw bias. And guess what? He's not a particularly good fader off it. <laughs> I coach a tour player just now who's who wants to fade it. He's got quite a lot of draw componentry in there. And he's played his very best golf as a fader. His relationship with a draw is isn't good, so there's not a mm-hmm. conversation to be had there. I'm not going to push him towards draw because that's that's straight away that compromises our relationship. He wants to it fade. I'm cool with that. I can turn it into a fade. Well, let me ask you a question about TrackMan. As far as like when stuff was coming out with TrackMan and they had that heat map that came up up um, of all the different colors and like you could be I don't know if you remember this this map of like there was like green and blue and then like red was like the hottest way that you could hit it this yep. is like in 2011 yeah, it's going back a long time and yeah and i remember when that came out i had heard that there was two tour players uh i think i know who they are but i, I won't say but i heard there was two tour players that heard because of this trackman heat map that if you hit up on the ball you could hit it much further and they had just won a a, a major 
and it was the only major that this guy won but then like he he saw this this map about hitting up on it and uh so are there things like that that can be true but even though it's true can damage your game if you chase it 100 percent, and that that would be myself and andreas Cayley have we, we have some fun with us all the time so I think the worst thing that's, and Andreas agrees, the worst thing that's happened to the game of golf in the last 15 years is the high tee and thinking you have to hit up on it. It's made bad players worse and it's made good players worse. Yeah. Here in America, it's weird because in baseball, you you do hit up on it, but every baseball player, they say hit down on it, hit hit the top yep. scheme. And so it's, it's a weird feel and real thing where all the baseball science people will say, yeah, hit up on it, but all the baseball players will say hit down yep. on it. And it's kind of, it might be a similar thing in golf. What, what starts happening biomechanically when you want to hit up on it that will then uh, start making it spray? Because that kind of seems what happens. Well, basically, you start to create, you've got your straightest face club, right? Swinging at the highest. Mm -hmm. And you're starting to create conflict in the impact and that you've got your swing direction going one way, you've got your attack angle going the other way, and then you've got a club path that's a product of the two. Now, there's, there's, a fun, there's another component in there that complicates it in that the more you create that kind of argument or disruption between attack angle, path, swing direction, you need to hit the middle of the club. And my experience of watching particularly good players try and hit up on it is that the more they hit up, so hitting up matches with a left swing direction because we're hitting it after the bottom of the arc, right? Now, yeah. the problem with that is that then the swing direction is going left, so the strike is probably going to bias more towards toe. So now he's hitting up, and the player starts to shift the swing direction, which makes his, his or her's ability to hit the middle harder. So while the scientific theory is absolutely true, you can't just apply it in a binary sense to golfers because there's other components at play particularly a high speed player, but generally anyone over a hundred miles an hour, I want them with basically as close to zero angle of attack and zero swing direction as they can. I want them to hit the middle. That's more important to me than generating speed or upward hit. You don't need to hit up in it for launch. 10 and a half degree driver, if you hit it in the middle of the face with a zero attack angle, is gonna launch at 10 and a half degrees. That's already within the parameters of good, right? Yeah, yeah. So, you talked yeah, a couple of sure. times about uh, appropriate impact. Mm -hmm. So just taking a step back, um, maybe if you can grab a club behind you or something, just t t talk to us about what is appropriate impact and what would be like a good or bad impact. Okay, so appropriate impact. I've got a club here. So appropriate impact, we're going to start with appropriate impact being hit in the middle of the club. Um, but actually, we've got leeway there. We've got probably plus five plus or minus five millimeters either side of the true sweet spot. And as long as the player is hitting the same spot in the face, that's going to help them produce a consistent outcome. From there, appropriate impact is entirely up for grabs depending on what that player wants to do ball flight wise. If the player has no bias or no preference, I want them to have a zero swing direction draw. So hitting down at four and a half degrees, say seven iron, swinging it at 90, Two ninety-three miles an hour, zero swing direction, face between the path and the uh, and the and the target line. I'd expect them to hit it one hundred and seventy meters or one hundred and sixty-five meters, at about a hundred feet with six feet of curvature. With a zero direction draw, like you're talking yep. about, at point of impact, like where the the club touches the ball for the first time, should the face be square or should it be slightly? No, up? it should be between the path and the target line. If it's square, if it's square to the target line, it will start on line and curve left. If it's square to the path, it will be a direct push. If it's open to the path, it will be a push cut. If it's somewhere between path and target line, it will be a functioning draw. So it needs to be a little open to the target for that. Open shot to the partner. target, close to the oh, path. Okay. So yeah, I, th I think that's a concept I had wrong. Okay. That's a, pr that's a pretty key concept. <laughs> Yeah, I keep watching my ball go for the target and everybody's like, oh, good shot. And I'm like, no, it's not. And then you just see it drift, you know, and go too far yeah. and then drift to, to the left. Yeah. So, so we know the face is too um, close to the path in that instant. 
Well, basically, as long as the shaft, as, as long as the shaft has increased in lean from address to impact, you're applying appropriate mm -hmm. force to the handle on the shaft, right? As long as it's hitting yeah. the ground after the golf ball, you've got mm -hmm. appropriate ground contact. As long as it's hitting the middle, you're now starting to combine all of the components that make up a great impact. Mm -hmm. The reason I, I'm I can be a little bit I'm, I'm being a little bit evasive on this is that from that point, there's so many other characteristics that need to match. So we need to ensure if it's a fade, the path and face talk to one another. Same for draw. Are we trying to launch it in the air? Are we trying to bring the ball flight down? Are we trying to spin it? Are we trying to not spin it? The 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 impact characteristic changes for all of those. All we yeah. know is that the ball can only do what the club tells it to. We talked a lot about how it's difficult to say like um, what things as far as like uh, what static things or even movement things are totally fundamental, but it seems like they're starting to emerge in your teaching some fundamental skills to have. Like you gotta be, have the skill to hit the center of the face, the skill to deliver the shaft the right way. What are some of your favorite ways to like, let's just hone in on hitting the middle of the face more often getting. So if we had the foot spray, you know, we're all over and we want to make that tighter. So what, uh, what's a good takeaway that people watching this can take with them to say, be like, Hey, try this to get your spread tighter. Okay, so what's a better way to hit the middle. You've part? actually come up with my favorite drill. Okay. Assuming the player is of a certain degree of competence and is going to hit the club face every time. Not fat it, not thin it. They're, yeah, not just with okay. it. Yeah. So I, I'm, I'm merely going to ask them to experiment with different strike points. So that what does it look like to hit it out the toe, to hit it out the heel? Where do you need to stand to hit it out the toe, to hit it out the heel? Where do you need to stand to hit it out the middle? Can you hit it out the middle two, three, four times in a row? So again, it's very, very task driven, but that would only, I think, apply to players, as I said, that are pretty good at hitting the middle or hitting the face anyway. So that that's interesting because so rather than putting the face spray on and just trying to middle it a hundred times in a row, you think they'll have a better practice session if they intentionally try to hit it in the toe, intentionally try to hit it I think in that, their heel. Yeah, and I think, I think that's part of it because it's it's just giving the 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 it gives the player a greater awareness of their relationship to the sweet spot in the golf ball. That mm -hmm. ultimately, if they're trying to hit the middle and only ever hit the toe. They, they, they don't have a, a relationship with the middle. They've got a relationship with the toe. So teaching them two ends of the spectrum and then finding that middle ground, I think, is a very good way to train center strike. When you're teaching somebody and you when when is at what like watershed point do you start to think that like, OK, they can't do this because of something physical, like it's a physical limitation that like you're telling them, hey, if you turn more on the backswing, you, you know, good things are going to happen, for example. When do you start to think like, okay, th one, this might be a physical thing, and two, it might be a physical thing that can be correctable uh, to make you a better golfer? Like, how does that conversation happen for you? Um, honest truth? Yeah. I think it's a bullshit cop-out for the majority of coaches. Yeah, you hear, the, you hear it a lot. Now, yeah. every player, let's, let's slightly reframe the, the conversation. Every player has got physical characteristics. But are you going to love a game? Let's go back to the very start of this conversation. Our job is to grow and better the game of golf. Are you going to fall in love with a game if the first thing your coach tells you is that you've not got the physical capability to do what he wants until you've gone and done, no, done no. all of this? So that's, that to me is a problem. That's not selling your services. It's not selling the game of golf. I believe it's the coach's job to work around that as much as humanely possible. Okay. You've got to find a way for that player to produce appropriate impact. Mm -hmm. The vast majority of golfers are not going to go away and embark on some kind of physical, let's call it a prehab program to get better at it. Right. The only time right. they do that is when they injure themselves and there's a decent chance they won't do any rehab. They'll go to the physio, expect the physio to rehab them without doing any work. So. Again, we're making the game harder to love. Not only have you told them, mm -hmm. well, shit, you can't move properly, so you're not going to be able to hit the golf ball properly. That's not doing a great job. Mm -hmm. Then you're telling them, well, actually, you now need to go and spend time with a physical therapist. You need to do this, 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 and this. And it might take six months before you've got enough range of movement to hit it properly. Yeah, especially, too, because a lot of times they'll say, well, Bob's a wreck, and he's taking my money every weekend. <laughs> and he, you know, he barely get out of the car, you know, you know so... 
there, it's it's not a uh, you don't absolutely need to be physically perfect no. in order to score really well. Well, yeah. I don't know. Tiger Tiger was a mess winning the uh, two thousand eight U.S. Open. Yeah. The, the the vast majority of how often do prof- professional athletes in any sport compete when they're at the absolute peak of their physical condition? Next, yeah, it happens just a couple of times in their career. Yeah, yeah. they're always dealing yeah. with a niggle, with an imbalance. I mean, it's the, they're either they're they're playing on their way to injury or they're playing on their way back from injury. the The truth of the matter yeah. is that as a golf coach, you can only deal with the physicality of that player in front of you now. What's a we talk a lot about how to be a good coach? Like how to, how can you be a good student? Like you're going into a golf lesson, you've heard about this guy, and you really you know believe in him want want to give this coach a shot what what are some things you can do to get the most out of your golf lesson that you're about to take go with specific objectives open-minded because quite a lot of the time the student comes with this set of ideas that this is what they need to do when in reality the coach thinks it's over here so be open-minded okay. uh, if you have specific objectives start questioning the coach if, the, if he's asking you to do X, Y, or Z, or she's asking you to do X, Y, or Z, ask how that is going to help them with the objective they set at the start of the session. Because one of, one of the great challenges of coaches is that, by definition, we need to be good at selling because we need to sell improvement to the player, and this is how they're going to do it. The problem with that is yeah. that we become increasingly good at selling flawed concepts. And the and the and the mm-hmm. and the, the, the pupil, the player, doesn't have any clue whether it's good information or bad information. And I, I found the best way around that is 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 for the player to get better, saying, "Well, okay, so I, I know I need to hit down on it more. How is that going to help me?" Straight away, you get a sense of whether that coach is any good because they'll be able to either come up with a really compelling answer or they'll stutter and stammer their way through it and not come up with anything. Right. But asking why—that's I think so important. I think Brendan. Yeah. That's what's really, I like to have a lesson with a coach that like has a lot of technology because it'll, whether he needs it or not, like it'll help sell me on it. Like if he says like, Hey, look, you're six degrees inside out. And, and we, you know, that's just going to, it helps build the whole story of why the, why the ball is doing what it's doing uh, like home, uh, so much better than just being on a range. Hundred, you know, I, I completely agree. And this, and this is where I think one of the major benefits to me using TrackMan is that I am now accountable for the advice I give. So in a golf lesson, I will say, I want you to do this and this, and this and that is what's going to happen. You do this, that will happen. I will tell you right now that if you do this, this data point will shift. And if it doesn't, Mm -hmm. the piece of information I've given is just the wrong piece of information for that person at that time. And it tells me, I want to know. I'm not going to just stand there for the next hour of that session saying, no, no, just keep doing it. Keep doing it. You'll get it. Yeah. If the data doesn't yeah. shift, it's not worked, does it? Yeah, you got to find a different way to, to say the same thing, maybe. Yeah. How important is communication to a coach? Okay, I'm going to put that, opinion. I'm going to put that question back on you. You have two coaches, both of which you can access tomorrow for three hours. And you're a player. You're not a coach. You're a player. One of the coaches has got a zillion qualifications. The other coach has got a fraction of those qualifications. One coach is an exceptional communicator. He understands how to adapt to each and every player. The other person is unable to communicate with another human being. Who are you going to go and take a lesson from? The guy who can communicate. Next question. Of those two, which one do you think will be the most effective coach over the course of his life? The communicator. It's the only thing. So why is it? So why is it that coaches don't make understanding the the skill of communication the number one priority? Because it's not sexy. Of the business. Can't sell that on Instagram. That's not a visual product. That's one thing that I've noticed doing Be Better Golf, where I go around the, the world interviewing different famous golf coaches. And that's the thing that I've noticed about the really top, most famous coaches. These guys are like radio hosts. They're, they're, they talk really well. Like if I go to Mike Malaska and talk to him, it's like his voice like, like sticks on your bones. You know, if you talk to Jim McLean, like when he talks to you, like it's like 
you're listening to like a really good radio show. Same thing with Butch and like a lot and uh, Butch's sons, like these guys, like they use their voice really mm-hmm. well. Whereas like if you go to maybe like a $75 lesson on a range or whatever, you get lots of mumblings and ums and they're, they don't really seem quite sure of what they're saying. Whereas like they might be saying the same thing. They might both be saying, hey, get your elbow closer to your side. But, you know, when Mike Adams or, or some of these guys say it, like it just sticks on you. And not just because like it's authority, like there's something about the voice itself that is very, very well developed in these top guys. George is a great example. Like George is a phenomenal example, but I'd also say that there is, there's, there's, there's another component to this. Okay. That you are in a different state of mind speaking to these coaches as you would be speaking to definitely, and that that affects how you receive their words, their advice. That affects how you interpret it, and it also affects mm-hmm. your perception of that experience. Yep. There's tons of people that can give the same yep. advice as George, but George has got the credibility of doing it at a high level. The credibility that comes with you cannot, you can have a great conversation with George, but he, he will be able to justify 100% why what he's asking you to do is effective. Mm-hmm. And because he knows that he's worked at a high level, he knows that he knows what he's talking about. He comes across as much more credible and much more convincing. For a final question that I have for you is uh, I'm a big user and believer in the hack motion thing. And I know that a lot of the hack motion data has come from you and come mm-hmm. from your players and, and uh, the, the pro version. So um, I just wanted to get your opinion on like, as somebody trying, so in, uh, with the hack motion, I'm almost always putting it on the left hand and looking at flexion extension. Uh, that's, I think, what about probably 90 or, or more percent of people who are just like self users of it do. Um, what, what are some of the best ways that you've seen that people use hack motion by themselves to get a better impact through the ball? First of all, I would probably discourage a lot of people from using it without some kind of guidance from a coach. Okay. Um, because the wrists don't just work in one dimension. So if you're dealing with flexion extension, you can't flex or extend without other components changing. Mm-hmm. So this, this is not a one dimensional move. Right. Okay. So if I go more into extension, that suddenly opens up the ability to create more radial. If I go into flexion, that's going to create more ulna. And then we've also got the components mm-hmm. of the supination pronation. So it's, it's, it's a lot more complex than just, well, I need to flex my wrist more. But okay. the thing I love about hack is number one, it gives you a semi-objective baseline. I, the reason I say semi-objective is that the positioning of the of the sensor on your wrist will always change a little bit. You're 10 degrees extended to 10 degrees flexed is never ever going to be measured exactly the same because the wrist the, the, the sensor. Yeah, I've noticed with it, it's, it's more important to pay attention to the shape of the entire line rather than like what numbers on the line. Yeah, I completely agree. Uh, where the line's happening and is, it, is, it, uh, is the shape reasonably consistent? Uh, and right. and when, when are the peaks and troughs happening? relative from address to impact. Uh, Mm -hmm. I love using the feedback mechanism, the audio feedback mechanism, because if I put that on a player, I can literally say nothing other than keep that noise on and they will move differently. I don't need to give them any advice. All right, Hugh, where can we find out more about you? And you, you mentioned your Instagram. What, what is your, your handle? On I, I am Hugh Mar Coaching on Insta. And I'm if you go to www.humar.com, you'll find my website, which has got all of the coaching offerings, whether it be coach education, physical golf coaching, business coaching, all the, all the good things that I do to hopefully help this game become a little bit better and grow a little bit. And where's your, where in, in England is your headquarters? Uh, just outside of London. So on the southwest side of London. Okay, great, great. That's perfect. Awesome. All right, thanks a lot for uh, letting us have you on. I hope to see you in person sometime. Yeah, that'd be cool. And, uh, and, and work together. Well, I think if, every, work if ever you're in the UK, you've got, a, you've got a place to call home and we can, uh, we can sit down and fix the golfing world yet again. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, final thoughts for somebody looking to get better. What should be their a, kind of attack plan? Have a plan. Um, uh, yeah. Attack plan number one: if it's an established golfer of any kind, regardless of handicap, yeah, keep some data, keep some on-course data, have stats, 
have something tangible you can take to a coach. Find a mm -hmm. coach who has got, th this is the single biggest thing, find a golf coach who has got a history of improving golfers of your demographic. Yeah. And yeah. because they are, they've, they've got results under their belt. The ones that are good talkers, mm -hmm. they, need to, they need to be able to back that up with effective coaching. Mm -hmm. And there are... Oh, this is a question. I, I, I do have one more yeah. question because I have it written down. I didn't ask you. Um, throughout history, yep. who do you think has the best... What coach do you think has the best track record of the most amount of people who came to this person got better and, they, and also uh, the percentage of improvement was really high? Like, who are some of your favorite coaches for just that kind of stat of like, wow, people really do get better when they see this person. That's, I'm not sure there's one answer to that. I think that there's guys sure. like, I, I, I took a lesson from George uh, before Christmas and I hit it better straight away. I played the next day and played great. So did he make an improvement quickly that I was able to hit to the golf course? Yes, so I'm gonna include George in there. Mm -hmm. uh, Dennis Pugh, in the UK, I think is one of the one of the great coaches. Uh, Jim Flick was yeah. just unbelievable at it. Um, generally, I think the guys that over John Jacobs. over time, John Jacobs was exceptional at it, and and John also kind of had a a series of disciples who also became very good coaches. But there yeah. there are a surprising amount of really good coaches out there who you've never heard of. Leslie King. Leslie King, in the uh, in the basement in Knightsbridge. Yeah, exactly. you you know your stuff, Justin. You've spent way too long reading about the history of golf. Yeah, really. <laughs> but there's a there's a ton of them out there, which is great for the game. But there's also a ton of guys out there who aren't particularly good, and unfortunately, yeah, in this day and age, media, social media following is generally a measure of whether you're good or not, and it's just not the case. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. Everybody follow thanks Hugh so on Instagram at uh, Hugh Mar Coaching. Follow Justin on Instagram at Elite Golf Swing. Elite Golf Swing with or, or S. Elite Justin. Golf Swing. Elite, go Elite Golf Swing on Instagram. And uh, subscribe to this channel here on YouTube. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye. Cheers, guys. Bye.